Hi, everyone. My name is Abdel Al Hausawi. I'm a hepatobiliary surgeon, but I'm also a patient safety advocate. It is my pleasure to share with you the second episode of my podcast with the title Vision Zero. This is a podcast about safety in healthcare. Every year, nearly 5 million patients die from unsafe care, not to mention the hundreds of millions of patients that are harmed without dying, you know, be it physical harm, psychological, or financial. So why did I start this podcast? I started this podcast to look for practical ways to reach zero harm, and hopefully to reach zero harm this year. You know, we can't wait long enough. By reaching zero harm, we will help save lives, we will minimize harm, we will save money. But the fourth, the fourth why that I always talk about is uh, we will work together towards peace. Because I view us working together to promote patient safety is, as a great force towards good. So before I my introduce my amazing guest today, let me share with you a quote that I always like to start the podcast with. Our problem is not that we aim too high and miss, but that we aim too low and hit. This was a quote by Aristotle, and I think my guest also agrees with this quote. So who's our guest? She's a mother, she's a widower, she's a family member who has touched by unsafe care not only once, but twice. She's a global patient safety advocate. She's, she was a director of the patient engagement of the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute between 2012 and 2016. She's a co-founder and past president of Parents of Infants and Children with Kernectris. And she, she, she will explain what Kernectris is. This is uh, an, an entity that works in partnership with private and public health agencies to eradicate Kernectris. In 2003, she co-founded Consumers Advancing Patient Safety, and she served as a president uh, of that organization from 2003 to 2010. She has an MBA from Thunderbird School uh, Global Management, and she has an honorary doctorate in Humans Letters from Adrian College. She has a professional background in international banking and served in Ecuador with her late husband uh, at Peace Corps Volunteers. So, ladies and gentlemen, help me in welcoming our guest, Sue Sheridan. Hi, Sue. Hi, Odilela. Good, good morning from my country. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good morning, good, good day for everyone. And, and basically, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to get to it. Uh, so... Uh, so if you could share with us your patient safety story, uh, both in 1995 and in 1999, and, and uh, how did you get involved with, with the patient safety movement? Sure. sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Abdullah, for the invitation to be part of this. And thank you for you being a champion and doing these, um, these sessions. This is really important. Um, what brought me into the patient safety world was an unexpected journey in 1995. Um, I, my husband, Pat, and I had a son, Cal, um, and he was born healthy, uh, normal pregnancy, normal delivery. Um, but within five days, Cal suffered permanent brain damage from the failure to diagnose and treat something very simple known as newborn jaundice. Um, a Billy Rubin test, which costs about a dollar, was never administered. They were visually kind of assessing uh, my calls to share my concerns about him getting lethargic and poor breastfeeding were um, uh, ignored. Um, when Cal, Cal was readmitted, there was unfortunate documentation errors. And long story short, um, he went from a normal, healthy baby to a very... Um, disabled baby in a period of five days because of these series, cascading series of patient safety events. Um, so today, Cal is 26. Um, he is very motor impaired. Um, he can walk with a walker. He's hearing impaired, speech impaired, um, very smart kid, but, um, you know, he has a body that just doesn't, doesn't work. Um, and, and to see how preventable his what happened to Cal was just 
I, I can't even explain the, 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 the pain that my husband and I went through. You know, fast forward to um, four years after that, my husband, my late husband, Pat, was diagnosed with a mass in his neck. He had a lot of neck pain. He was very athletic. So we thought it was just from him being um, over, you know, working out. And um, it was discovered that he had a mass. So they took it out and they shared with us that it was a benign tumor. And um, we even collected the, the documents and uh, that, that said it was a benign schwannoma. Um, his pain returned six months later and um, they did surgery again and they found this time the tumor was the size of a surgeon's fist. Um, it was discovered it was a sarcoma. It, we were led to believe at first that it was, that it became a sarcoma that we la later learned that the original pathology got lost. And the original pathology that was done 23 days after we were discharged um, indicated a high grade synovial cell sarcoma that during the months of non-treatment, it spread throughout his spinal canal and they um, could not save his life. And so he died two years later, 45 years old with um, a four-year-old and a six-year-old. We had a baby in there during that time too, Mackenzie. And um, so I got to see really significant holes in our healthcare system. And like you said, I came from international trade finance banking, a very disciplined profession with a lot of regulation and a lot of oversight. And I assumed that our healthcare system was the same, that there was oversight, that someone was in charge of patient safety. But I learned that wasn't the case. Well, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, that, that and, 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 you know, from, um, maybe it's 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 difficult to go through the, the 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 details, but if you could just share with us the the five days and 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 the sure. number of uh, you know uh, op opportunities that the healthcare system could have intervened uh, and, and they didn't, uh, and and you know just 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 to 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 think through why this happened to start with and whether or not it's still happening as, uh, as we speak. Right, right. Um, first of all, I don't mind talking about those five days, Abdulayla. I mean, they're not happy memories, but um, you know, my whole reason for wanting to speak about it is so others can learn. And um, so this won't happen to other families and babies. Um, so after Cal was born, he was, uh, it was a normal delivery, very healthy little boy, our baby boy. He started to get um, yellow, you know, while we we're still in the hospital. It was never brought to my attention. But later after we looked at the birthing chart, they started identifying jaundice when he was 16 hours, which I didn't know that that was a red flag for, for newborns. Um, we were told it discharged when it was 33 hours. Um, everything was fine. We were told he was a little yellow. They said not to worry. It was normal. They gave me a little handout that even said John was, was a normal phenomenon, babies, not to worry. So I didn't. And um, we got Cal home and on, like, in the, and he was a very aggressive breastfeeder. He was, you know, he would sleep every, you know, wake up every three hours like a normal baby. And then he started to wake up every five hours and he started to be less interested in breastfeeding and he would get kind of floppy. So I called the hospital and I shared that what was happening with Cal, that he was getting more yellow, he was getting floppy, hard to awaken. And they, their first question to me was, was I a first time mom? And so they completely shifted to me and not my baby. And they said, mom, you need to settle down. This is normal. And, you know, sleepiness is normal in, in newborns. Well, we weren't satisfied with that. So we called the pediatrician. <clears throat> he also said, mom, I'm more concerned about you than I am your baby. But if you'd like, you can bring him into my office. So we packed him up and went to the doctor's office. I showed him how he wouldn't breastfeed normally. He would take a few sucks and kind of fall off my breast. He was very orange at this time. Um, we didn't know there was even a test for Billy Rubin or we didn't even know what Billy Rubin was. We knew what jaundice was. And the doctor thought maybe he had an ear infection. Um, so he sent us home with antibiotics and asked us to use antibiotics for 24 hours. We got home in about five or six hours. I called the doctor said, our baby is changing for our eyes. And he said, no, stay on the antibiotics. They'll kick in. Well, eventually, Cal, I mean, it, it was obvious that he was, he, something was going on. So we finally 
um, we find, we took him back to the pediatrician and said, we need to do something. And he said, well, go, go to the hospital. We'll get your baby tested. So we got to the hospital. Um, a resident um, was there to receive us and he took the history and physical and they admitted him onto the pediatric floor, not into NICU or any specialty area. Um, the resident um, unfortunately made a documentation error and he wrote down that Cal had the same blood type as mom. Um, he was unfamiliar with how the birthing charts were written, how the nurses wrote in the birthing charts. So he, because of his assumption that baby and mom had the same blood type, a blood incompatibility was ruled out. And um, had they tested his blood, actually, they never tested his blood. And we, we later learned Cal had blood type A, I was O, so an a, a O incompatibility was going on. Um, had they known that, they would have treated Cal more aggressively with the exchange transfusion. And they, find, they did it Billy Rubin. It was 34.6. For those of you who know Billy Rubin, that's extremely high. It was the highest recorded at that hospital. Guidelines were not followed. Um, they did not do a, a, an exchange transfusion and they just gave him simple phototherapy. Um, and we kept reporting these very strange symptoms of Cal. He started to arch backwards and he started to have this high pitched cry, almost like a cat. And it was the second day Cal was in the hospital. And so we called for help and a neuro consult and um, no one was really that concerned about his behavior. Um, but he was experiencing something called opisthotonic posturing. His legs were trembling and he, we watched him suffer brain damage at the hospital. Um, after that, he could no longer breastfeed. Um, he um, was a completely different baby. Neurologically, you know, would startle and um, he didn't develop. We were discharged, what they said, a well baby. Um, a lot of the information was not shared with us. They did an MRI in Cal, which showed um, abnormalities in his globus pallidus in his brain due to hyperbilirubinemia. Um, that information was not shared with us. Um, so we went on a journey of trying to figure out what was wrong with our baby for almost 16 months. And then finally, Cal was diagnosed by um, specialty, out, specialists outside of our state um, that clearly indicated he was classic textbook case of Cornicturus or brain damage from newborn jaundice used to be the second leading cause of cerebral palsy in the United States up to the 1970s. And then they learned more about it and they learned how to identify it and how to treat it. So it really was eradicated in the United States for almost 20, 25 years. Um, in the 1990s here in the United States, they stopped doing routine testing of jaundice. Um, I think a lot of it was a cost saving um, effort and um, a significant number of babies uh, kind of fell through the cracks during that time in the United States and in other countries um, and, and ended up having Kronicker. Some, some babies die from that. So that, that was the, you know, those five days where, you know, a series of you know, not following guidelines, nursing not notifying a pediatrician when uh, there's clearly something pathologic going on with him, um, a resident who didn't know how to read the chart um, no one really overseeing the, you know, the resident's work. Um, I always felt for that resident. Um, so it was just, like I said, a kind of a cascading, there are a lot of weak links in, in the, um, in, in the patient safety in those days. And, and w did, did you have like, uh, <clears throat> you know, proper disclosure where this was recognized by, you know, by the, the, the hospital leadership and, 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 and the, you know, the attending in, involved, et cetera. How, 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 did, how do you rate the, uh, the disclosure process once it was right. recognized? Yeah, there was no disclosure. Okay. Yeah, we had to, you know, it was, it was um, kind of swept under the carpet, I would say. And we were discharged with what they said, a well baby, and he was a very sick baby. And so we ended up, you know, over the years or over the weeks and days and months going to several specialists all over, but in our own state. And then when we are finally encouraged by a clinician to go out of state to, you know, a specialty center, um, it wasn't until, you know, 16 months later that we learned that this was classic cornicterous 
Um, at that time, there was no communication between me and the hospital. And when I tried to reach out to them, there was um, the door was closed. So, so, so I think we, we, and again, I, 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 uh, I say we. I'm, I'm, I'm a practicing uh, surgeon, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I can, I can do self criticism that we, we, we uh, still need to do a lot to improve uh, the safety of, of patients, but then also we, we need to do much better job when it comes to uh, disclosing, uh, you know. Uh, address events, uh, you know, regardless of how difficult or horrible they, 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 they you know, they, they are. And uh, maybe, maybe that takes me to, to, to the second question, which is uh, based on, 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 you know, unfortunately you, 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 you were involved in two uh, Patient safety incidents that, that that we call the uh, the errors of omission because we we have errors of commission where mm -hmm. you know a surgeon like me could uh, harm a patient while he or she is doing a procedure inadvertently, but then we also have an errors of omission, which is uh, a diagnosis that is being overlooked and 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 uh, unfortunately two very close. Uh, Family members of yours were 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 the uh, you know the recipient of that uh, of diagnostic right. error and and uh, uh, so I want you to to, to talk through uh, the past twenty six years of journey you know you you becoming you know a champion to uh, to push for for that and maybe uh, again I don't want to put words in your mouth but but I sure. think. What it, what maybe what one of the things that is motivating you is to make sure that this harm does not happen to to other family right. and other people. So so do you think uh, either in 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 Cal's case or past case that uh, this continues to to happen? Well, let let me start with your first question or your first point that you brought up. Uh, first, my answer is yes, um, but let me give you a little background on that. Um, after I learned that Cal had suffered brain damage from his newborn jaundice, something that in the developing world is uncommon. Um, I learned that it was common in in um, countries in development, um, and so I was. As you can imagine, I mean, as a first time mom, the baby that I nurtured for nine months, I went to every class there was. Um, I had no idea. I was not equipped with any information to, to help me protect my son, to equip me with the right information to protect Cal. So when I learned the reality of Cal's situation, he would have a disability the rest of his life. His goal when he was diagnosed was to learn how to sit up. Um, I had to visit my soul and decide, did I wanna just curl up and die or did I wanna you know, get out there and make a difference? And I chose get out there and fight like hell. So um, that led me on a path to understanding our healthcare system. And here in the United States, we have a very fragmented disjointed healthcare system. We don't have anybody in charge of our healthcare system. We have lots of agencies and lots of accreditors and research and public health, but we don't have anybody in charge. So I found my way to Washington, D.C., and I was fortunate enough to testify at the first national summit on uh, patient safety and medical errors in 2000. And after that, there was a lot of media about Cal and Pat's stories, and they were on front page of journals, Wall Street Journal and USA Today. And so the, uh, these, these other mothers found me whose children also fell through the cracks and had conductors. So together, this group of mothers, we grew from 70 to in the United States, or from seven to um, in the United States. And now we're probably a global community of, I don't know, 250 all over the world of mothers and fathers of children have conductors. In the United States, the moms decided to co-produce a safer healthcare system. And we reached out to the accreditors. We reached out to CDC. We reached out to the National Institutes of Health. Um, we reached out to the very system that failed our kids. And so we worked together for eight years 
Um, we did research on the effectiveness of bilirubin testing. Is that safer than visual assessment? Um, so it, after eight years, um, the, I mean, the Joint Commission stepped in, our creditors, they issued two Sentinel event alerts and consumers were involved in helping author those Sentinel event alerts. Uh, the CDC granted funds to our researchers who conducted research to identify that a bilirubin test was more effective and safer than visual assessment. Um, NIH conducted more um, research. Um, so it took, um, you know, it took the patients weaving together our healthcare system to change the protocols and the standards and the American Academy of Pediatrics did update their guidelines and clarify their guidelines to say that it was important to test all babies prior to discharge. And that's exactly what the moms wanted. That coupled with um, information to the moms that it was important that we knew that jaundice could cause brain damage. And we learned, you know, we really had to challenge some of the authors of the prenatal books and challenge the American Academy of Pediatrics who authored a lot of, um, you know, books for mothers who are expecting. And we, and we worked together on this and we did focus groups and surveys and we did research on here in the United States. And we learned of course that mothers and fathers did want to know that jaundice could cause brain damage. There was a belief, you know, 20 years ago that if that kind of information was shared with mothers and fathers that we would overreact and that they thought we'd, it would be bad for us to learn about that. Um, we got that changed. So both at the CDC website and the AAP, all the mother information and father information clearly shares that this is something that's very dangerous and can cause brain damage. So, so we did implement change in the United States. We believe that the level of the numbers of cases of connectors have gone down. Um, our mother group is so active here in the United States that we're usually the first parents report it to. And, um, you know, in, in our country, there's no official collection of data on the the prevalence of cronicterus, which is a, um, a, a sad a sad state to really recognize that we don't collect a lot of data on who's harmed. Um, but we do know that protocols have been um, implemented in in the, in the hospitals in the United States. We do know we've changed the standard of care that all babies get tested. Um, we do know hospitals have measures now, quality measures to ensure that parents are properly educated and that there's bilirubin tests and there's notification if there's um, jaundice within 24 hours. So we knew, do, do know those changes have been implemented not only here, but in Canada, some in Mexico. And, um, and this is all because of mothers who got engaged. So we think we've made a difference. Um, we do know that cronicura still happens. Unfortunately, during COVID, we saw more cases because babies couldn't get um, back into the hospital when it was necessary because especially because of um, blood incompatibilities and RH factor um, that they weren't able to get the care they needed because of COVID. So that, and so we know that this past year, there were some cases. Wow. And I, and I always believe that, you know, once, uh, you know, everything's said and done after COVID, we're going to look back and find out that there are way more people that were harmed by COVID uh, and indirectly because they just could not get access to right. care. Right. Or we as providers, we kind of just put, you know, drop the ball and, 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 and focused just on right. COVID. Right. Forgetting everything else. Right. Dangerous. Dangerous. In terms of Pat's error, you know, the failure to communicate a malignant cancer. Um, I can't say we've made much progress on that. And, um, you know, evidence shows that between seven and 15%, and it depends on what journal you read, but, you know, between seven and 15% of life threatening test results never get communicated to the patients. That's unacceptable. And to my knowledge, over the past 20, it's been 19 years since Pat died. Um, I haven't heard of much that has changed and that it continues. Um, so that's still on my to-do list. Um, it's unacceptable, you know, to hear from people say, oh, it's so complicated. I just don't buy that. Um, there's so much we can do. And um, so that's to be continued, you know, that, that story. 
Um, you know, going back to the jaundice, Abdulayla, um, another another phenomena that's happening, although all babies, almost all babies are getting tested now in the United States for the jaundice. Um, we're finding that, you know, we're a very diverse population here. And so we have um, kiddos now that have suffered brain damage because from their jaundice because of either they're African-American and people we're visually assessing. Um, Eastern, Middle, um, Eastern uh, Mediterranean kiddos have G G6PD, which is there's no routine test for that and enzyme deficiency. So they might look fine at two days, but then their bilirubin goes up exponentially um, and it doesn't get caught. So actually we moms right now have invited ourselves to the guideline development table with the American Academy of Pediatrics. And we are reviewing and um, making recommendations to first the new guidelines that will address some of these issues that we see happening. And again, you know, uh, what, what, what the story that you mentioned is music to my ears and in, in, in the case that you know out of this tragedy having having the the, the mothers uh, work together uh, you can actually impact change and, and, and that goes Absolutely. against against the paternalistic approach that again we and uh, as, as, as a healthcare provider Absolutely. Uh, we have the, this idea that uh, you know as a patient you should stay in your lane. You just do right. as, right. as 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 you're told, and 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 it just proven over the fa you know the decades that this is just not working. So uh, let let me right. go to the the point of why we didn't reach zero harm, and I, and I want you to address that from from the same kind of uh, you know the, the the angle that you've you've discussed about. Uh, you know the points like well it's complicated etc that the, the whole point of not even empowering patients and families with with the with with the with their own health data i, I currently advise right. uh, ahima the health Inf information management association and uh i'm in any opportunity i i, I have I, I i try to push for the point that you know the health records data Right. Is, is owned by the patient. So we we have a responsibility to make sure that A, we tell them that they own their data uh, yep. and, and B, that if they needed to understand this complicated quote unquote, we can uncomplicate it for them and, and, and just make it yeah. simple so they, Absolutely. they can understand it. So, uh, wh while you're answering this question about why you think we, we didn't uh, you know reach zero harm, um, uh, out of the the the, the, the mothers uh, of the of the association, you know, for uh, mothers with, for for kids with connectors, yep. how many uh, can you tell that they actually felt that there was something wrong, but they were not empowered to to act? Do you, do you have a rough estimate? I would say every one of us. Wow! I, every mother, yeah, and I would say every one of us indicated that we saw something was going on with our baby. Uh, we reached out for help, and our the symptoms that we're reporting were not taken seriously. Um, mothers and fathers uh, were both. Um, I think there's a lot of unfortunate biases about new parents that we overreact, and so we were. I would say 100% of our parents um, in, identified something was going on, and but healthcare didn't take any action. I mean, it, and, it is, it is, it is, it is, yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, and we get, you know, we're in communication with countries all over the world. And, um, and this is, this is very common and that, that we, I, we see something, I mean, we're moms, we see something that's not quite right, but we're not, um, either not taken seriously. Now, some countries like Nigeria, where this is a, a, a tremendous problem. And we here in the United States are now connected with the moms over in Nigeria, um, and a, a wonderful program. So, so this is going to take place in the lower middle income countries. A wonderful program has taken place in Nigeria where mothers have partnered with researchers and clinicians and they created a whole new empowerment program for mothers in Nigeria. So they did jingles on the radio. They did parent education before, you know, before they had the baby event at the clinic or wherever they had their baby. And they reduced 
carnivorous. And so when we talk about empowerment, it's not just the United States or developed countries. This is happening. You know, this can happen all over the world with the right leaders and the right right people. Absolutely, and 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 I, and I think uh, I, I want you to 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 address how the international, you know, banking industry uh, deals with, you know, how, how, how their processes are different from, from healthcare, you know, coming from, <laughs> from that. But, it, it, you right. know, I think, I think we, we want to look into uh, other industries and, and the fact that, again, you said almost 100% of the parents that had those kids felt that there was something wrong, but the, the, the system does not have uh, a way to, 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 or let me say did not have a way because I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will have a way where right. uh, when, when we're moving forward with, towards, you know, a patient-centered and a person-centered care where we have the co-production uh, piece. But, but I, I want to hear from you yeah. uh, about, uh, you know, the international banking uh, industry and then, you know, we can sure. talk about other industries that have actually transformed the sure. uh, safety sure. and processes. Sure. Well, when I was in international banking, this was in the 1980s, so I'm dating myself. Um, when you are a bank that lends to a foreign country um, and you've got customers who are depositing money into your bank, um, number one, we could only accept a, so much risk in our international portfolio. So we, the government watched us and guided us on how much international risk exposure we could take. So if we're lending to South America or lending to other countries, we could only take so much risk. And we were audited for how much risk we'd put in our portfolio because ultimately could put our depositors at risk. And um, so, but the FDIC in the United States, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation would insure depositors, now it's up to $250,000. So if the bank made a mistake and you know got into too much risk in lending um, or assumed too much risk in lending, our government insured customer deposit up to $250,000. So we had all this like protection for the depositors. We had the government watching how much risk we are assuming in our portfolio, our lending portfolio. And um, so that, that, you know, I was just used to that kind of environment of checks and balances and, and not letting our bank take on much risk and also ensuring our customers that they'd get money if we failed. I thought the healthcare system would be the same. And mm -hmm. I didn't see any kind of oversight of the risk, you know, that hospitals, um, uh, that, you know, there's all kinds of risk in the healthcare system. And I thought there was some type of oversight of this and that there was more standardization of practices. Um, and the fact that, you know, we were hurt in the healthcare system, there was certainly no insurance for us. There was no guarantee we'd get, you know, any kind of insurance. And so, um, so that was really shocking to me, you know, having come from this very disciplined profession with, oversight and ensuring we were not going to hurt our depositors. And um, then I compare that to healthcare. I mean, we were regulated and there was a lot of standardization and there was a lot of rules and laws that we had to follow. And, and there, I could not find that in the healthcare system. Yeah. And, 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 and I think go, going back to the, to the, to the point of the, in, in, the, the empowerment of, of not only patients and families, but I think that the, the entire staff, what, one of the best practices of, of aviation, you know, we, we all fly, uh, we used to fly before uh, COVID and, and hopefully yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll go back afterwards. Uh, you see that during takeoff and landing that the, uh, that the windows uh, basically have to be uh, clear. And mm -hmm. I asked, and I realized that they do that because they want to use all the passengers as uh, extension of the, uh, you know, the crew. So if there's any uh, smoke or fire, or whatever, people would right. see that, and then they would they would they would report it report to it. The, to the crew. So in a way, 
you're actually using the entire uh, you know passengers as part of your team in critical right. points. Now compare that to healthcare, mm -hmm. where uh, you know a, 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 a worried mother or father are completely just brushed off. Right. Uh, and I think you know I I I'm I'm going to go to uh, my next question, which is how can we reach zero harm? And I, and I want you to talk about you know coal production because um, right. in and I think. In, in Cal's case or Pat's case, uh, I believe both that if we had coal production, we would have uh, avoided both uh, mistakes. Right, right, right. So you asked me earlier, why didn't we reach zero harm? And now how can we reach zero harm? And the answer is the same. We absolutely have to de democratize healthcare. I mean, we've been waiting 26 years since to air is human. We have not made enough change. Yes, there have been pockets of change. We must engage the patients, the families, the communities, civil society, patient organizations, as called by the WHA, the 72nd uh, WHA uh, call to action about patient safety. They are calling all member states and, and maybe challenging all member states to engage us as problem solvers. Um, we have not been engaged as much as we should have been. And going forward, we absolutely we need to democratize and talk about co-production. And when we talk about co-production, you know, a lot of people talk about just the patient provider point of care. But when I talk about co-production, I talk for the entire ecosystem. So we need co-production in research. We need co-production in policymaking. We need co-production in medical professional educations. And we need co-production you know, at the doctor, at the organizational level and at the doctor patient level in all of those levels. And um, so I think to get to zero harm, we need to democratize healthcare. I think member states and countries need to um, invite, identify and groom and grow and nurture uh, patient groups um, who can be the champions to partner in co-production. They need to train the patients. We need to identify um, courageous, committed healthcare leaders who aren't satisfied with the status quo and who are humble enough to in, invite the public into the healthcare world. Um, and, you know, we have to create an infrastructure to, to bring in the public into healthcare and, and learn from us. So I think that's, I think that way um, it gets, I think that accelerates change when you bring in the public because we're less patient um, and um, it, it can cause a different dynamic where, um, like you said, we're not numbers, we're human beings that have lost family members or are living with harm. And um, we want, we have this sense of urgency, which I think we've lost that sense of urgency in, in patient safety for whatever reason. Uh, we need to get that back um, and, and, you know, really ramp up our game. So. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but you asked, how do we get to zero harm? I don't think the healthcare system can do it without the patient and family and community, uh, you know, members. Um, I think you've been missing a, a really important partner for years, <laughs> and we're here. Uh, you know, I know I know patients and family members all over the world who would be delighted to be invited or and to get engaged in creating a safer healthcare system. On the flip side. You know, there's a lot of us out there who are inviting people like you to our tables to have discussions. So we're not going to wait for the invitation that we're saying, no, let's, you come to my table, let's have this conversation and let's make a change together. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so let, let me, before I ask the, the last question, acknowledge you for, you know, for the, for the leader that you've been over the past uh, 26 years, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, people that uh, go through adversity, could either, as you said, you know, just uh, disconnect, uh, or could actually use that as 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 a, as, a, as an energy to 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 push forward. That I think you 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 you've chosen the latter, and uh, I I think you and 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 all the organizations that you've worked with have saved. You know, just looking at the the, the stats, I think you've saved 
thousands and, 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 and maybe tens of thousands of lives. I think you've touched millions of lives that without even knowing because with, with, with some of the policy changes that you've, you've championed uh, uh, is, is a, an embodiment of co-production. So, so I, I, I really uh, you know, would, would like to uh, congratulate you on, on, on those efforts. And, and uh, I think you are a champion of, uh, of the journey towards zero harm. So that's why I'm, 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 mm -hmm. I'm honored and privileged to have you, uh, you know, as, as a friend and as, as someone who's uh, uh, also, uh, you know, a thought leader when it comes to, uh, to, to patient safety. Well, so, thank you. And I have to give credit to, you know, being a patient advocate in this world, one of the most healing and delightful parts of, of you know, the patient safety events in my family was meeting healthcare leaders who opened their doors to me and others, and that we worked together. And it was, there was no model for that. And so for the CEO of our accreditation for the Joint Commission to say, yes, I'll work with you. And for CDC to say, yes, I'll work with you. To identify these leaders within our healthcare system that were passionate warriors and they didn't care what their peers thought. You know, that was a great, that was so great for me to see. So that, you know, those leaders out in, there, in the world, we've got to find them. Amazing. So uh, final thoughts. And, 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 and again, maybe we, we've been talking about this before we, we, yeah. we started the, the uh, you know, broadcasting, which is uh, how can we, reach zero harm in this year, 2021. And, and uh, do you think that we would see zero harm in our lifetime? I'm gonna answer your second uh, question first. Yes, I think we can see, I think we can collectively work together. And in some areas, yes, I think we can see zero harm. Um, and, and I think they're already seeing zero harm in certain areas where we get laser focused on preventing something and, and, and um, eradicating some you know, patient safety events. Um, for 2021, the journey to zero harm, again, um, I have to say we've got to bring in, we have to really focus on co-production. We've got to bring in some very um, um, passionate leaders and patients to, you know, write the new plan for patient safety in the future and, um, you know, demand uh, that we keep this on the radar. You know, what, what scares me, Abdulayla, is that we've been at this for 26 years. Um, and, you know, when my, I don't know if I told you this, but my, the story, but when Pat died, my late husband died, um, he was actually in Disney World. We took our kids and 53 family members to Disney World, because that was my husband's last wish. And he died at Disney World. Um, and we got to spend, you know, precious time together. And he said to me, um, probably the morning before he died, we talked about what I was gonna do as a single mom. And he said, Sue, he said, whatever you do, he said, do not give up on patient safety. And that's what I asked the leaders not to do. I see leaders and organizations and agencies giving up on patient safety. We can't do that. And so um, I fear that I see us getting retired, you know, patient safety getting retired. No. And so we need to embrace this opportunity with your leadership, with other leadership, what's going on, um, you know, with the WHO and other areas. We need to keep this a priority in, in the world. Wow, uh, I'm 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 gonna use actually start quoting that if you allow me uh, that, that do not give up on on on, on patient oh, safety. Absolutely, I think, I think such a statement from someone who was uh, harmed by 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 the healthcare system to to say yeah. that as uh, you know some of his last words is uh, is is a big motivation I think for for us to 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 do uh, better. So. Uh, Again, uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, you know uh, all the great work that you're doing for coming in on the on the on the podcast and and hopefully, you know, part of this uh, effort is for us to make, you know, you talked about democratizing uh, healthcare 
and democratizing safety. I think democratizing also the, 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 this this conversation and trying to to kind of bridge the information asymmetry uh, with b between patients and families on one end and and healthcare providers on the other end. I, I truly believe if we have it in ourselves as providers to really look uh, for patients and families as uh, equal partners with different responsibilities, not as, uh, you know, passive uh, uh, recipient of care, right. uh, but as, as, as uh, actually, you know, uh, team members uh, sure. and, and looking at patients as the most important team member. Uh, I think we can we can really make a, a big uh, leap uh, I agree. Uh, zero harm. Uh, right. You know, I continue to be optimistic, and, and and I think conversation with 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 leaders like yours uh, and 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 others who are kind of taking charge uh, of this uh, effort uh, makes me uh, you know uh, very very optimistic. So again, thank you very much. Well, one last thing, something Abdulayla is that. A reporter asked me, said, Mr. Sheridan, he said, I bet you and the other seven moms never imagined that you'd change the standard of care in jaundice management. And I said, oh, yes, we did imagine that. And so <laughs> my last parting shot is we absolutely have to keep hope, stay hopeful and imagine it. And let's just just go there. Perfect. So with that, uh, let's let's uh, stay hopeful and, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, when things settle down, we, we can uh, meet up and, uh, you know, learn about your uh, current and new projects. Uh, towards yeah. zero. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.